In this section, we're going to move away just a little bit from our focus on application level protocols and focus on application level distributed infrastructure for implementing a service. The service that we're gonna to wanna to take a look at is video streaming. It's an application we all know and love and probably use a lot. There's some amazing examples of very sophisticated distributed infrastructure to implement video streaming services. So there's a lot to learn. We're going to start off by looking at video as an application. And then, as we've seen, the internet can introduce variable delays between a sender and a receiver. So we'll take a look at client-side techniques, buffering and adaptive playout to mitigate the effects of variable internet delays. Then we're gonna take a look at something called DASH, Dynamic Adaptive Streaming over HTTP. And we'll see how DASH can be used to accommodate changes in available capacity, available bandwidth between a source and a destination. Then we'll look at an example of DASH in use, looking at CDNs, content distribution networks, and Netflix as an application. So there's a lot to see, a lot to learn here. So let's get going. Streaming video traffic is a major consumer of internet bandwidth. By some estimates, 80% of residential ISP traffic is streaming video traffic. Now, when we think about streaming video, a couple of challenges are gonna be apparent. As always, there's the issue of scale. We're going to wanna to be able to reach tens or hundreds of millions of users. The second challenge is that of heterogeneity. Some users are going to be mobile, some are going to be fixed, some are gonna be on high speed broadband connections, other are gonna be in bandwidth poor connections. How are we going to cope with that kind of heterogeneity? And as we'll see, the answer is a very sophisticated application level distributed infrastructure. Let's start our discussion of streaming video by looking at the structure of video itself. A video is just a sequence of encoded images, sometimes called frames, taken at say 24, 30 frames per second. And each image is a matrix of pixels. Those pixels are usually encoded to reduce the size of the images and therefore reduce the size of the video by exploiting image redundancy. There's spatial coding that exploits redundancy within an image. For example, in this image here, rather than storing n repeated purple sky pixel values, we could store the single pixel value, purple, and the number of repeated instances. That's two values to encode that part of the image rather than n. That's coding within a frame. We can also code between frames. If the image doesn't change much between frames or changes just a bit, we can then just send the changes between frames, for example, rather than the entire new frame. And there are two broad classes of video encoding methods, constant bitrate video and variable bitrate video. And as the name suggests, in constant bitrate video, the video recording rate over time is going to be fixed, constant. And with variable bitrate coding, the encoding rate's going to change over time as the amount of spatial and temporal correlation changes over time. We see here a number of encoding standards whose encoding rates range from MPEG-1 at 1.5 megabits per second to MPEG-4, which is what we're recording these videos in, for example, that can run up to 10 megabits per second and higher. Now, when we think about the technical challenges associating with streaming stored video, there's going to be two sources of complexity here. The first has to do with the fact that the amount of available bandwidth between client and server is going to be changing over time. There could be congestion in the home network, in the access network, the core network, the network within the video server complex, or within the video server system itself. So the amount of available bandwidth is going to vary over time and we're going to need to be able to adapt to that. Secondly, we've seen that the delays between a source and a destination in the internet, between a client and a server are also going to change over time. It's not like there's a circuit with a fixed delay from source to destination, guaranteed bandwidth between source and destination. The packet switch network, we're going to see variable delays and so we're going to need be able to adapt to that at the client as well. Let's start by taking the big picture view and take a look at the three steps involved in streaming stored video. First, the video is being recorded. Secondly, the video is being sent by the server. And finally, third, the video is being played out at the client. And we'll do this in the context of this diagram here. On the x-axis, we have time going forward. And on the y-axis, we have the cumulative amount of data that's been recorded, that's been sent, or that's been played, as we'll see. In this first black staircase curve here, we show video being recorded. 
Let's assume for simplicity that it's a constant bitrate video. We see more and more video being recorded over time with the cumulative amount of data going up at a constant rate, say with each jump representing a new frame's worth of recorded data. This video is then stored and then eventually transmitted by a server here. In this example, the video is being transmitted the same rate at which it was recorded. If it's an MPEG video recorded at 5 megabits per second, then it's being sent at 5 megabits per second. But it could be sent faster or even slower, but let's assume for simplicity that it's being just sent out at the recorded rate. After some network delay, shown here, the video playout begins at the receiver, again at the same rate at which it was recorded. And now we see why this is called streaming video. If we look at this point in time here, we can see that the client is playing out frame 2 while the server is sending frame 10. Rather than downloading the entire video before playing it out, the client begins playout while the server is still sending, that's to say streaming, later frames in the video. And you might want to think about the advantages of streaming video rather than downloading the video in its entirety first and then playing it out. With streaming, the client can begin playout earlier, and if the client doesn't watch the whole video, we're not wasting a lot of bandwidth transmitting portions of the video that aren't viewed. Now over on the client side, we're going to have to deal with a constraint known as the continuous playout constraint. And this means that the timing of playout at the client side is going to have to match the timing from when the video was first recorded. So you're sitting at the client, you're playing out the video, everyone's engaged, it's time to play out a piece of video. That piece of video better have arrived from the server to the client in order to be played out. If not, we're going to see that spinning uh, dial that you see here that we've all seen at one time or another. The source of the challenge here is the variable delay between the video server and the client. And to mitigate that delay, we're going to use buffering to absorb some of those changes in delay. There are other challenges as well, like how to deal with client-side operations like fast forward and rewind. And if packets are lost, they'll be retransmitted if we're streaming over TCP, resulting in additional delay. So a fundamental challenge we'll need to address is that of variable network delays. Let's see how this is done. Let's again return to this figure and again assume constant bitrate video being transmitted by the server at a constant rate, as shown in the red staircase curve here that we've seen before. The difference between this diagram and the previous diagram is that the network delay for each video frame is now going to be variable. Remember, in the previous diagram with a fixed network delay, the black staircase curve had nice even staircase steps because network delay was assumed to be constant, fixed. Here the steps are no longer nice and even. Sometimes there's a longer horizontal step, like here and here, when the network delay of a frame is significantly longer than that of a previous frame, and sometimes the horizontal delays are quite short, like here and here, when the network delay of a frame is significantly shorter than that of a previous frame. Because of the variable network delay, frames are no longer received with a timing that matches the timing needed for playout. To accommodate this so-called jitter in network delay, a client's going to use a buffer to smooth out delay. As shown in the blue playout curve here, a client will now also wait before beginning playout. But once playout begins, however, the client's going to play out video with a timing, shown in blue here, that matches the original timing as shown in red here and in black in our earlier figure. How long should the client wait? <laughs> well, that's the million dollar tricky question. If the initial client playout delay is too short and frame delays are highly variable, a frame may not arrive in time for its playout. That's called starvation and gives rise to that spinning wheel that we're used to when videos freeze. And if the initial client playout delay is too long, well, then the user has to wait longer before video playout begins, and users hate to wait. Having taken a look at client-side buffering and playout, let's now turn our attention to the challenge of varying amounts of bandwidth availability between client and server. Buffering's great for absorbing variable delay, but what happens when the amount of available bandwidth that exists between the client and the server just isn't enough to support the rate at which video is being transmitted from client to server. In this case, we're going to need another solution, and that's where Dash, Dynamic Adaptive Streaming, over HTTP in this case, comes in. 
And so here's how Dash works. And let's start at the server side. The video that's going to be streamed is divided into chunks. Each chunk is then encoded at different encoding rates, at different levels of quality, and stored in separate files. Larger files are going to be associated with chunks of video that are encoded at higher quality. And so it's going to take longer, a longer amount, a higher amount of bandwidth in order to be able to download those. These different chunks, each representing different encodings, are going to be stored at different nodes within a content distribution network. And finally, there's going to be a manifest file. The manifest file is going to tell the client to pick up this chunk at this particular level of encoding. Here are the server nodes, the CDN nodes, that you can go to. On the client side, the client's going to do the following. It's going to periodically estimate the amount of server-to-client bandwidth that's available and ask itself, can this path support even more traffic? Can I request the next chunk at a higher fidelity? When the client needs a chunk, it's going to consult the manifest and request video one chunk at a time, choosing the maximum coding rate that it's estimated to be sustainable given the currently available bandwidth. It can choose different coding rates at different points in time, depending on the amount of available bandwidth at that time, and it can choose which server to request a chunk from. So we see that in Dash, the intelligence, the control, is really at the client side. The client's given information, the manifest file that lists its options. The client then monitors performance to determine the encoding rate and the CDN node from which it'll make its next request. That puts a lot of intelligence at the client. So let's step back and ask ourselves a fundamental question. How do we want to structure an application that's going to be able to stream videos to potentially thousands or hundreds of thousands of simultaneous clients and to be chosen from a catalog that could have millions of videos in it? What are the options for doing this? Well, we might start off by thinking about, well, a mega server, one massive server that's got all of the videos and it's going to handle all the requests coming in from all of the clients. So what are the problems with that? Well, hopefully it's obvious to you. It's a single point of failure. Obviously, there's going to be a potential for congestion there in the network and also in the video server itself. And then finally, there are going to be long delays between the video server location and some points on the planet. In short, this solution just doesn't scale. The second option, the approach that's adopted in practice, is to build a large distributed infrastructure to store and serve copies of video chunks at different geographically distributed sites. This is an example of an application layer content distribution network, a CDN. The servers in this network are loaded with content to serve, and either a manifest file or a CDN DNS server will point a client to the content that the client's requested. There are two approaches that are taken in practice. In the enter deep approach to CDN, the CDN servers are pushed deep into many access networks at the internet's edge. In 2015, a CDN company known as Akamai, headquartered in Cambridge, had a quarter of a million CDN servers deployed in more than 120 companies. And I'll add that in 2018, one of our faculty members here at UMass, Ramesh Siddharaman, was part of the team that received an ACM SIGCOM Networking Systems Award for building Akamai's content delivery network. The second approach is known as the bring home approach. And in this approach, a smaller number of larger server clusters are located in POPs, points of presence that we learned about earlier when we were studying section 1.5. Now let's walk through an example of streaming a video via CDN. Here's a network setting. We see Netflix Central here, and we see copies of content, say including copies of Mad Men distributed around its CDN nodes. And here's me sitting at home, and I want to watch a particular episode of Mad Men. So my Netflix client app sends a request to Netflix Central saying, hey, Jim wants to watch this episode. Netflix Central then returns a manifest file listing the video chunks and their locations, as we saw earlier. My Netflix client app might then begin retrieving a video here from this nearby CDN server, performing buffering and client playout, as we saw earlier. And if that path happens to get congested, my Netflix client might choose to get the next chunk from this server here. Now, if you think about Netflix, it's not an ISP. It's about content, not about the network. But it uses the networks provided by ISPs to deliver content over the ISP's network at the application layer. 
For this reason, a service like Netflix is sometimes called an over-the-top or OTT service since it's an application-level service writing on top of the IP infrastructure. And you might recall in our very first class when we asked ourselves the question, what is the internet? We answered that question in two ways. We gave a nuts and bolts answer describing the pieces of the internet, but we also answered that question by saying that the internet was a service infrastructure on which amazing applications are being built. And that's precisely the point of view taken here with OTT services. Well, I hope you found this section interesting. We stepped away here just a little bit from a, an emphasis maybe on looking at protocols to look at application structure itself, particularly the case of a large scale distributed application level infrastructure for streaming stored video. We started off by looking at the characteristics of streaming video. Then we looked at buffering techniques and playout strategies at the client. Then we looked at chunking and that's where we encountered dynamic adaptive streaming over HTTP dash. Then we wrapped up by taking a look at content distribution networks very quickly there and the example of streaming stored video over a content distribution network.